Hey everybody, I'm Dylan, and this table took me eight months to build. And as I tell you the story of how this table came to be, it will become self-evident why it took me so long. <laughs> About a year ago, we had a tornado come through my area and knock down a bunch of trees. And this walnut tree was one of them. The first thing I needed to do was to make a trailer so that I could pick up the logs because they were too heavy to lift. And then once I got them back to my house, I didn't have any way of cutting them up, so I actually had to build a mill, which took me about another month. Once I had all of the walnut logs slabbed up, I had to find a way of drying them. And so it was at this point I decided to build my kiln. Now each one of those projects that I just mentioned was a massive undertaking, and I do have videos going over all of those builds. If you want to see those, I'll be leaving them in the links in the description. After a lot of trial and error and a few months in the kiln, my walnut wood was finally ready to be used, and that brings us up to date today. I decided that what I wanted to do was to build a walnut live edge table. This is definitely the kind of work I want to do more of going forward. I love the idea of building live edge tables. There's so many beautiful things that you can build with slabs like this, and I want to learn to do that going forward. The first thing I needed to do once I had everything dried was I needed to flatten it, and I had to build this flattening jig because these wouldn't fit through my planer. If you want to see how to build the flattening jig, I also have a video on that. This alone took about a day just to flatten all of the slabs, but it went pretty straightforward. Now you're going to hear Brad's name come up twice in this video because he has helped me a little bit behind the scenes. Brad is a guy I met over on TikTok and he does a lot of amazing work himself, but he also let me onto this router bit that I'm using here. This bit was really helpful in flattening all these slabs, but not only that, it has these replaceable carbide teeth, which makes it really nice to keep the blade nice and sharp. And not only did he help me find this flattening bit, but Brad also sells a product that I'm going to be using at the end of this video that made this walnut wood look so beautiful. I cannot recommend that stuff enough. On some of the smaller boards, I was able to flatten it using the router jig, but then I was able to flip it over and run it through my planer. But of course, not all of these would fit through my planer, so I could only do these with the smaller slabs. I also used the router jig to flatten this top piece that actually came off the top of one of the logs and this ended up being the legs. The reason I wanted to use the top of the log for this part is because I wanted as much sap wood in the project as possible. And if I had cut the same thickness of a piece out of the middle of the log, it would have had a lot less of that sap wood to work with. One of the things that I've learned with this project is that I really need to get a proper track saw system in the shop. There were so many times where that would have come in handy during this project, so I have plans in the future to acquire one, but that won't be for a little while. Of course, I was able to work around it for now, mostly using my homemade track saw and my table saw. And then I could go ahead and run two of my sides over on the jointer, and this is mostly so I can end up with two perfectly flat sides, 90 degrees to each other, using the fence of the jointer. And this is one of the fantastic reasons why you really should be trying to get a jointer in your shop if you're going to be doing this kind of work. And then I could use those first two sides as a reference and mill my legs to their final dimension. And now for my favorite part of a live edge build, and that's removing all of the bark off of the pieces. I cannot tell you how much fun it is to take a dull chisel to all of this bark and just watch the pieces fly off. You do have to be careful because you only want to go as far as the cambium layer. Once you get to the sap wood, you want to make sure to stop, otherwise you're basically wood carving by that point. I have since learned that once you get to the cambium layer, it's a good idea to stop and use a wire wheel instead of going straight to sandpaper the way I did here. I sanded this nice and flush, and honestly, I think it looks beautiful just the way it is, but if you want to leave more of a natural texture on the wood, it's a good idea to hit it with a wire wheel instead, but all of that comes down to personal preference. Now that the legs are all milled down, I can turn my attention to the rails that connect the legs together. I'm going to be able to get all of the long rails out of the board on the right, and the board on the left is going to be all of my short rails. One of the funny things about working with slabs is it's really hard to determine what will and will not fit through my planer. <laughs> I had to stop this one in the middle of the cut and then cut it down to its final size first before I could then again run it through the planer and get it to its final thickness. And now that they're much more manageable, they actually fit through the planer. <laughs> Since I just eyeballed these cuts with the circular saw, I had to bring these over to the jointer to flatten them. Whenever I have a board this messed up, I usually run the back of the board over the jointer once or twice just to remove a little bit of the material. That way I don't have to do quite so many passes over the jointer and remove so much material. At that point, it just takes a few extra passes over the jointer and they're all nice and flat. Then I could follow the exact same process with all of the long rails. Except for with the long rails, I did end up with a good enough surface that I could use the table saw to cut two of the longer rails. I figure these two bottom ones don't actually need a live edge on them, and I didn't want to waste this material, so I used these for the bottom two rails. 
In a little bit, I'm actually going to be beveling these boards to about 5 degrees, so you might be wondering why am I spending so much time flattening these rails, and that's really just because I know how complicated these tenons are going to be in a little bit to get precise. The biggest reason to flatten this is just because I'm going to be using this as my reference edge to make sure both of my tenons are perfectly parallel with each other, so this edge has to be flat. This piece here is one that I am the most excited about because it's going to end up being the top of the table. It's far from perfect, but out of all the slabs that I have, I felt like this one had the most character and is going to give me the best surface for a tabletop. Once again, I had a ton of fun removing all of the bark off of this slab. If you've never done this before, it's so much fun trying to follow all of the curves of the wood and only leaving the original live edge. I imagine this is sort of how stone carvers feel when they're trying to find the piece within the project, although in my case, there's a pretty obvious line to follow. <laughs> A couple of times I found these indents that I couldn't really sand away or chisel away so I had to get a carving chisel to remove those. And then I can come back after that with a little bit of sandpaper and kind of flush them out a little bit. Actually carving this little piece right here was the one that got me to realize that I really should be using a wire wheel for this instead because that would get this same defect all over the natural edge of the wood. And that would leave the piece with so much more character than what I ended up doing here. After that, I went through all of my pieces and sanded everything up to a 120 grit, and that was mostly just to remove all of the mill marks and any imperfections in the pieces. And then it came time to cut both ends off of the slab, and this is where I found things to be really interesting, because there's no reason to say that both of your ends need to be parallel with each other. Maybe you would prefer them to be uh, perpendicular to the edge of the slab. All these slabs that I'm working with have a slight curve to them, and you could make them perpendicular to that if you want to, but really that just comes down to how you want to make yours. And this is one of the things that I love so much about slab work, is it's really just down to what your eye says looks best, and that's it. There is no right answer here. I did have a little bit of trouble routing the mortises inside these legs. I think I was using the wrong router bit because I have to move this left and right just for it to be able to do a plunge cut and this router bit really isn't set up for that. I also added two stop blocks as positive stops so that I could make sure I had the right size mortise. Previously, when I've done this operation, I've used a router jig template, and that always works really well, but I decided to use this one on my tabletop. And even though this did work well enough, I probably won't be using this method again. I was originally thinking that what I wanted to do was to cut a 5 degree angle on all of the rails of the project. But once I had done that and set everything up and sort of mocked it up, I decided I didn't really like that look, and I ended up cutting the long rails to a 90 degree and only the short rails to a 5 degree. A while back I broke the locking mechanism on my miter saw so I had to be extremely careful with these cuts to make sure my saw didn't move during the cut. If anyone could help me find the parts to fix that properly, I would be very appreciative. I can't quite figure out what I need. Cutting these rails to 90 degrees on the ends rather than 5 degrees like the short rails not only simplifies the project but in my opinion is going to make it look a ton better. And then once I had everything down to its final dimension, I could run everything to the planer one more time to make sure everything was nice and uniform. The first challenge when trying to cut tenons into a live edge piece like this is the fact that you can only use two of your reference edges to cut the tenon, which means you need to be able to flip your piece over and cut an even amount from the back side. And so I ended up setting up this sort of complicated tenoning jig here where I could flip it over and reference the far edge of my sled and still get the same size tenon on both sides of my piece. It took a little bit of extra setup to do it this way, but it ended up working out very well. Of course, the square rails were a hundred times easier to get a square tenon because I could use the same stop block for both cuts. Most certainly, the most complicated thing about this project were these 5 degree tenons on the end of these short rails. So I had to do a little bit of complicated sorcery here to make sure that these tenons were nice and square to the edge of the board. I decided that if I put a perfectly square piece on the other side of this dado stack, I could cut a perfectly square tenon as long as everything was measured perfectly. And surprisingly enough, this worked perfectly first try. The cool thing about this method is it references the end of the board rather than the side of the board, which is what you would normally reference. And that allows me to cut this recess on both sides of the board no matter what angle I'm cutting it at. And then I can repeat that same process on all of my boards. And then I raise the dado stack a little bit so I can cut a notch into the end of each of the tenons. And then I could set my other saw up with a rip blade and a stop block so that I could cut the front end of each tenon. I found the best method for making sure these tenons stayed nice and square was to cut the majority of the waste off with a handsaw, 
Then I could remove the rest of the waste with the chisel and then start rounding the piece with the chisel. And then I could turn that into a round tenon using an 80 grit sanding block. And then after a little bit of more cleanup, it gave me a perfect tenon. And now I can go through and spend the next four days sanding through everything. I'm just joking, it didn't actually take four days, but it sure did feel like it. I sanded through every single grit I had, which goes from 60 all the way up to a 2000. I wanted this piece to be highly polished when I was done. And now, after this copious amount of work, it's finally time to assemble something. I cannot tell you how amazing it feels to finally be able to assemble the first pieces together. Whenever gluing a mortise and tenon together, I found it really helpful to use the mortise sort of as a pocket for the glue, and then I just use these cheap paintbrushes to paint on the glue onto the tenon and inside the mortise. You can also see I added a bunch of blue tape onto this. I wanted to make sure that I didn't have any of the glue seep into the grain. That corner is really hard to sand after the fact, so you want to make sure to keep all of the glue off of that wooden surface. A long time ago, I inherited these bar clamps from my grandpa, and for some reason, they're the only clamps I own that don't seem to mar the wood and I find these extremely helpful for making sure that the tenons seat perfectly into the mortises. Because I want this whole thing set to 5 degrees, I have to chamfer this top edge to the same 5 degree angle. And I'm still rocking my homemade track saw system, which does cut very straight, but it's also kind of floppy, so I had to put these spacers underneath so that it wouldn't fall down while I was cutting and mess up my angle. And then after I had everything nice and clamped down, I clamped everything together so that I could just take one long rip along the entire top surface of both of the panels. I wanted to do this in one pass just in the off chance that I messed up the angle of the saw when setting it down or anything. If I just did it all at one time, I could be completely sure that it wasn't going to change its angle on me. And this ended up working extremely well. I needed a shelf for the base of this and I hadn't cut that down yet and so I decided to go ahead and make a template so that I knew what shape to make it. Now this part might be a little bit controversial but I intentionally left a little bit of a gap so that you could see one of the bottom rails by the time I was done but personally I love that look. The way I see it I'm going for a sort of natural edge look anyway and I really like the idea of seeing some of the structure of the piece. That way it sort of shows off the yin and yang aspect of this piece of nature and engineering. Because of the way the shelf needs to sit inside the base, I had to cut notches into the shelf piece so that it would fit nicely. After cutting the majority of the waste off with the table saw, I could cut the notches with the scroll saw, and then I could fine tune those notches with a 5 degree angle with a sanding block and a chisel. One of the biggest reasons I chose this piece is because on the other side of this slab, there's a beautiful knot that's going to stick out into the walkway. The knot doesn't stick out past the table any farther than the top of the table does, so I think that this adds a beautiful aspect to the entire piece. Once again, I'm trying to accentuate as much of the nature of this piece as possible. So I spent a ton of extra time working on just this knot section alone so that it would look perfect. And lucky for me, this piece was small enough that I could just run this one through the planer. <laughs> so much less sanding if you could run it through the planer first. I had a little bit of trial and error figuring out what I should leave square and what needed to flow into the natural live edge of the wood. My original intention was to leave these square ends open so that you could see them, but I ended up not liking that so I decided to patch these instead. In the future my plan is to recess the entire board, not just the tenon, into the leg so that you don't see this kind of defect anymore because I really wasn't a big fan of how this looked when I was done. But it really wasn't that difficult to fix, I just glued in a piece of wood that matched the grain, and then I could come back and sand everything nice and flush and everything blended so much nicer after that. Although once again, for the eighth time, I did have to sand this leg all the way through the grits. And of course I had to do the same thing with this bottom shelf. Every time I decided to sand through the grits, I think it took me at least two hours. But it always looks so nice when you're done. At this point in the project, I was finally on the home stretch and I could start gluing in the short rails. And the blue tape worked so well the first time, I decided to do it again on the second one. This really just keeps all of the glue off of your non-gluing surfaces. It's a very time-consuming step, but totally worth it. This is always the most nerve-wracking part of a build, trying to make sure that all of your pieces fit together nicely, and if I mess up the glue up, then I could end up gluing this out of square, and then the table will have a rock to it. And although you can fix that a little bit in the future, it's so much better if you can just get it square first try, and you can save a few hours of headache. This actually went together perfectly until I realized I forgot to install the shelf. The way I built the shelf, it won't fit unless I glue up the rails and the legs with the shelf already installed, and so I had to pull everything back apart to install the shelf, and then I realized that the tape that I had put on the top of the bottom rails were in the way of the shelf, 
and that there would be no way of getting that tape out once I put the shelf in, so I had to spend some time getting that tape out while the glue was drying on my tenons. Eventually, I did end up getting everything glued together perfectly, but it was a very stressful 15 minutes. Before I can add the top to the base, I need to account for the future expansion and contraction of the walnut slab. I don't expect to get a lot of movement out of this small of a piece, but it's definitely something you want to pay attention to. I ended up making these brackets that hold the top to the base using mostly friction. The reason this is so important is because if you don't let the tabletop expand and contract naturally, it has a tendency to pull your joinery apart or even pull your base out of square. It's definitely not a step you want to skip. Since I don't need all of these brackets to be 100% identical, I just eyeballed them using the edge of my insert as a reference when I was cutting them. This is a really quick way to get them all basically the same size, and then I could drill a hole through all of them with the drill press and then countersink all of them so they can accept a screw. I had a couple of these small holes throughout the piece and I decided to leave the majority of them open, but on the tabletop itself I wanted to fill them with some sort of black material. Now a lot of the time people will use something like black epoxy to fill knot holes in wood, but because these holes were so small I decided to just do something simpler and I went with a black CA glue. After doing a few tests, I found out pretty quickly that the pigment inside the CA glue will seep into the wood if you don't hit it with an activator right away. So what I ended up doing was to fill up any cracks that I had with the CA glue and then hit it with an activator and then just start building up layers after that with the CA glue and then the activator and the CA glue again. Eventually I had a layer built up thick enough that I could sand it down flush with the surface. After I sanded it down, I did find a couple little air bubbles in there and I just went back and filled those back in with CA glue and sanded it down once again to a 1000 grit and then it was perfectly flush with the surface. I didn't want to sand with anything coarser than a 1000 grit because I didn't want to sand away too much of my slab material, so then I went to a 1500 grit and then once again to a 2000 grit polish. Now that the base is finally dry, I can take all of the tape off and all of the clamps and get them out of the way. It takes a surprisingly long amount of time to make sure you get every single piece of tape out of all of the crevices of a table like this. It's not really difficult, it's just time consuming. I found myself reaching for this chisel quite a number of times because I couldn't quite get my fingertips in there. So I just did a quick test and I wanted to see what I was going to use as a finish for the walnut table. And I have this tongue honey from a buddy of mine, he sells this. Uh, this is an oil and, and wax finish. I've been wanting to use this thing for a long time because I've never used it before. And I used it against this Odie's oil, which is also an oil and wax finish. And this is the one that I did with Brad's tongue honey. And this is the one that I did with Odie's oil. And personally, I can't see a difference. The Odie's oil took me a little bit longer to apply, and the Brad's Workbench Tongue Honey, it, it's, it's a little cheaper. Even if I was to buy the same amount, it would be cheaper. This is about 30 bucks for the same quantity here. Um, so I'm personally sold Brad's Tongue Honey. I'm gonna be putting a link in the description to this if you wanna see this, uh, I highly recommend it. But like I said, this stuff's more expensive. Looks the same to me. And here's the tongue honey finally going on the bottom surface of the table. It's important to remember that if you do want more of a high gloss finish, you can also use a buffing wheel on a drill or something like that. But personally, I love the way that this looks. Uh, this is exactly what I was going for, and the fact that it already has a mixture of wax and oil means I can skip an entire step of my finishing process. I've really never liked the look of a plastic top finish on something like a polyurethane. It works for a lot of people, but when it comes to something like this where you're trying to show off the natural beauty of the wood, a plastic finish sort of just takes away from the, the beautiful nature of these slabs, so I didn't want to do that. Just keep in mind that a finish like this isn't going to be quite as durable, but it should be relatively durable for something like a tabletop surface. You just have to be a little bit more careful with it than you would a, an average dining room table you would get from a big box store. Beauty just has a tendency to be delicate in that way. And now for the really hectic part, I had to, oh my gosh, that thing looks pretty. <laughs> and now for the hectic part, I had to flip this over and onto the bottom of the top panel. I was a little worried I was going to scratch up the surface while I was doing this, but everything went pretty okay. And here are the brackets going on. I didn't pre-drill any of these into the tabletop surface. I didn't think it was necessary. I did put a little bit of tongue honey on each of the brackets just so they would match the rest of the table, but I didn't show any of that part. And if you look really closely, you can see how I left a little bit of that gap between the bracket and the rail. I can't even count the number of times I've seen people just put pocket holes into the rail and attaching the tabletop that way, but if you do that, then that means you're holding the rails directly to a piece of wood that's gonna be expanding and contracting over the seasons. And if you let that happen, then there's a good chance that your joints are going to pop loose or you could end up with a piece that's slightly more wobbly than it otherwise would, and so you really have to account for that with the way you attach the tabletop to the rails themselves. 
And now that I have these brackets in place, if the tabletop does decide to move on me, it won't have any problem moving those brackets around and adjusting for it. And now for the last step, putting on the last little bit of Brad's Tongue Honey. I have to say, from all of the projects I have ever done in my shop, this one is my absolute favorite. And not just because of how well it turned out, but because of how much work I know went into it. After eight months of building the mill, building a kiln, building a flattening jig, building a trailer... <laughs> I have never before had any project take me this long and put this much work into a single project and not only does it symbolize all of that work but everything I've learned about milling, about drying my own materials and building furniture that I can truly be proud of. It also shows what you can accomplish if you just keep moving forward and working on something. I've always said on this channel that if you're trying to learn to do something new you have to expect failures and expect to learn something from it and this project 100% symbolizes that. Almost everything that I did over the last eight months, it feels like I had to do it twice because everything was such a learning process. And now that the project is done, I've proven to myself that all of this is even possible. And I am nowhere near done either. Going into the future, I want to do many more of these furniture builds and possibly even for sale. I have huge plans coming this spring and summer, so definitely stay tuned for those. Anyway, thank you all for watching. Catch you all next time.